Hi, my name is Autumn Dixon with a balanced saint of mind.com. If you prefer reading or listening, you can check out that website. I post written versions of the videos that I do for my channel. So this week is March 22nd through the 28th, and we are talking about section 29 of Doctrine and Covenants. I actually, there's a lot of doctrine in this section, lots of different things. So basically, there were six elders that came to Joseph Smith and they had questions. It's around the time that Hiram Page had his stone that he was receiving false revelations from. So they had lots of questions and they were asking and section 29 is an answer from the Lord to these men. So there's a lot of doctrine going on in here. One of the doctrines, the doctrine that I want to talk about specifically in this video is the age of accountability. So the age of accountability I have a very close friend, and this very close friend of mine does not like, he kind of pushes back against the policy that our church has to baptize children at eight. He doesn't like it. And he doesn't like it because he feels that eight-year-olds are not actually ready, and they're not mature enough, and they're not cognizant enough to be able to make promises that are that big. Now. I'm obviously going to fall on the side of the church at this, say, trust them. <laughs> I have received a testimony of them. And so I'm going to fall on the side of the church with this. However, there's not a lot of personal examples that I can give to my friend to argue with him because I do not remember my baptism. <laughs> and that might be really, really sad, but I simply don't. I don't remember my baptism. Sometimes I think I have a vague memory of sitting in the middle of the confirmation circle, but even that I'm not so sure if I imagined or if it is an actual memory. I just, I don't remember going into the font, nothing. I don't remember my baptism. So I can't really argue with him from a personal standpoint that eight-year-olds are mature enough to make these big promises. Now, I want to go ahead and I want to read a couple verses in section 29 that talks a little bit about this. So, this is Doctrine and Covenants. It is section 29, and it is verses 46 through 47. And it says, But behold, I say unto you that little, rich, little children are redeemed through the foundation of the world through mine only begotten. Wherefore they cannot sin, for power is not given unto Satan to tempt little children until they begin to become accountable before me. Did you catch that little word? I've never consciously noticed that word associated with these other words. They begin to become accountable. Now, I... I was kind of afraid to actually share this. It was a phrase that caught my attention very early on as I was preparing for this video, but I kind of shied away from it because I didn't know if it was an entire set of doctrine that I could make a video about, and I was also worried that it wasn't particularly solid doctrine. But I was led to a quote by Bruce R. McConkie. And this is what Bruce R. McConkie has to say about the subject. So. He says, accountability does not burst full bloom upon a child at any given moment in his life. Children become accountable gradually over a number of years. Becoming accountable is a process, not a goal to be attained when a specified number of years, days, and hours have elapsed. There comes a time, however, when accountability is real and actual and sin is attributed in the lives of those who develop normally. It is eight years of age, the age of baptism. I love that principle. Accountability is a process. Little children can begin to become accountable to their Heavenly Father. And part of what I love about this is an eight-year-old is not going to be held to the same standards as an 18-year-old or an 80-year-old, all depending, of course, upon what knowledge they've received in this life accountability grows as our knowledge grows. Now, so if all of our accountability is kind of different, right? Eight-year-olds aren't all raised the same. Some were raised with a really strong family that was teaching them the gospel. Some of them were hardly raised in church at all, but their parents decided to have them baptized anyway, right? 
they were not all raised the same. And so their levels of accountability are all different when they're baptized as well. So does that mean that they should all be baptized at age eight? Maybe we are asking the wrong question when we ask that. Maybe it is the wrong question to be asking if eight-year-olds are ready, right? We've been taught that. But what are other questions we can ask that, I guess, make a better argument for why we should be baptizing children so at this young age of eight? And one of those questions is, what does a baptismal covenant do for us? Now, when we make our baptismal covenant, we promise to take Christ's name upon us, to always remember him, and to keep his commandments. Those are big promises. And as we grow older and we continuously fall short and our eyes are opened and we see that we're falling short, we have all received a testimony that those are big promises to make to our Heavenly Father. However, when you make this promise at baptism, it's not going to automatically start hurting you, right? You don't have this huge level of accountability thrust upon you as soon as you make that covenant at eight. Because like we said before, our, our accountability grows as our knowledge grows. And so the point that I'm trying to pull out of that is our baptismal covenant and these promises and that we're making, these promises that we're making are not going to hurt us. They're not all of a sudden you're eight and you're baptized and all of these things are going to be held against you when you make this promise, right? Our levels of accountability will still be appropriate to our levels of knowledge. And that goes for an eight-year-old. Now, so we know that, that these baptismal covenants are not going to hurt us, but how do they help us? I'm going to turn to preach my gospel that teaches us a little bit specifically about our baptismal covenants. So, preach my gospel. Quote number one that I want to talk about. It says, keeping covenants brings blessings in this life and exaltation in the life to come. So, baptism, like I just said, isn't going to hurt us. In fact, it brings blessing in, blessings in this life. So, not only does it bless us in the eternities, but in this life, it enables our Heavenly Father to bless us more because we have entered into a contract, a covenant, a contract with our Savior Jesus Christ. This enables Heavenly Father to be able to bless us more than he did previously. And it also places us on the gate, like through the gate, towards exaltation. That's what baptism does. Second quote from Preach My Gospel. By keeping the commandments and serving others, we receive and retain a remission of our sins. So just now I said that we entered into a contract with our Savior Jesus Christ. The covenant is a two-way promise, so I often think of it as a contract that we are making with our Savior Jesus Christ. Now something else that Christ often compares it to is marriage. So he always talks about the bridegroom, all of that, right? Sometimes when Christ is talking about these covenants that we're making, he talks about a marriage contract. And traditionally in marriage, finances are often merged together, right? The woman and the husband, the wife and the husband, bring their debts and their assets to the marriage, and it merges when they're married. It's okay if you don't have that traditional form of marriage, if you keep your finances separate, more power to you. That's your decision. But the reason that I bring this up is because I want to teach a principle. When we enter this covenant, this marriage, this contract with our Savior Jesus Christ, it enables His acts to pay for our acts, right? We can receive and retain a remission of our sins when we're baptized because we have entered into this contract with our Savior. Third, quote from Preach My Gospel. It says, through sacred ordinances, such as baptism and confirmation, we learn about and experience God's power. So, baptism. Baptism is a tool to help us learn, to help us grow towards our Savior. 
It can bring exaltation. And part of exaltation is learning, right? It's a process of learning so that we can become like our Heavenly Father. And baptism can place us on the path. And baptism is a tool in and of itself for us to learn about Heavenly Father and His power so that we can start moving more quickly and progressing more quickly towards exaltation. Now, um, just to reiterate, these promises that we make when we're baptized are not going to hurt us because levels of accountability and levels of knowledge are taken into consideration by a righteous, perfect, all-knowing Heavenly Father. And <laughs> really what baptism does for us, it doesn't hurt us, it just gives more opportunities for our Heavenly Father to bless us. Now, we don't necessarily, I guess, we don't need to be baptized earlier than the age of eight, right? Right now I'm talking about how, oh, it's not going to hurt us when we're baptized yet. We don't need to be baptized before eight because it says that little children are perfect in Christ. Sorry. Little children are perfect in Christ, and so they don't need to make that covenant. If we were to baptize them younger, it kind of says, oh, we don't really care about the atonement. It mocks the atonement. Little children already have that relationship with their Savior. And so they've been made perfect in Christ. We hit eight when we start to be held accountable for our own actions. And when we make that covenant, we enter into a contract with our Savior so that his acts can continue to pay for our sins. Now, baptism, as I said previously, uh, is helps us on our path towards exaltation. It helps us learn. Now, Heavenly Father often sends us on journeys before we are quote unquote ready, right? I was not ready to serve a mission. <laughs> and even at the end of my mission, I still wasn't ready to serve a mission. <laughs> and I failed in lots and lots of ways. The same thing goes for marriage, right? My husband and I dated for a really, really long time, and we knew each other really well, so when we got married, there weren't a ton of unpleasant surprises about him. I got those through when we were dating. Just kidding, babe. But after we got married, I did learn a lot about my own weaknesses, and I did learn about what it would take to make a happy relationship, and I learned how to be more selfless, because if you want to be happy in a marriage, you have to learn to be selfless. And it's really interesting because there was no other way that I could have actually become ready to get married, right? <laughs> that relationship is so unique that the only way to really learn how to be a good spouse is to get married. <laughs> and I'm not saying just jump in and it'll all fall into place. Not what I'm saying at all. But I do believe that's the truth, right? Part of learning is actually experiencing, and it goes the same for baptism. The world would teach us that we need to be ready before we make these big jumps and these big promises. Heavenly Father teaches us that as we start to take these steps of faith, like baptism or sealing or whatever covenants we might be making in our lives at this time, He will help us learn the process as we go. And as we make these covenants, we access more blessings. And especially with baptism, right? We access the power of the Holy Ghost. And the Holy Ghost can make life so much easier, even for an eight-year-old, <laughs> to help them learn things the easy way instead of the hard way. These eight-year-olds are going to be experiencing the same things whether or not they get baptized. But when they have been baptized, they have access to more blessings from their Heavenly Father. And... They have access to the Holy Ghost that can help them learn things the easy way instead of the hard way every single time. Baptism will make our life experiences easier. And there's no new level of accountability that Heavenly Father is going to place on an eight-year-old's shoulders. Now, what implications does this hold for us as adults or someone who is not eight years old, right? Well, there's kind of two things that I thought about when it came to implications. One goes back to the idea that our accountability grows with our knowledge. 
And this is, this is a gift that Heavenly Father does this, that he, I want to say almost kind of hides our own, hides some of our weaknesses and our frailties from us. Because if we were to honestly see how far we had to go, and if we were to truly see ourselves in how much, like I said before, how much farther we have to go, it would probably be really discouraging. And so just slowly, Heavenly Father opens our eyes and we see this gap. And so we strive and we strive and we strive and we make it and we're almost getting there. And then he opens our eyes a little bit more. And then we have to strive and strive and strive and we almost get there and we think we're doing a great job. And then he opens our eyes some more. Our accountability grows as we become more righteous. We actually get to see more of our flaws so that we can become more righteous. This is a comforting concept that our Heavenly Father is merciful enough to only let us see a few steps ahead that we need to improve on. Second implication that I thought of for us is that we need to learn to love this journey. <laughs> that these big steps of faith, whether you're looking to get married or you're wondering if you should go on a mission or if you should get in doubt, whatever it might be, if you're questioning whether you are ready for these big steps, obviously follow the Spirit. The Spirit's going to have a better answer for you than I will. But these big steps that Heavenly Father has given us in our lives, they, the world will teach us that we have to be ready for them. And to an extent we do. You should prepare for baptism. You should prepare to go on a mission. You should prepare to get married. But these big steps are actually only going to propel us further. Right? I always, I always think about the fact that we have to be sealed in order to become like our Heavenly Father. And I don't think that's just because you have to have a husband or a wife in order to become like Heavenly Father. I think it's because that relationship is so unique and calls so much of you as an individual. That that's one of the only relationships that's going to help us become like our Heavenly Father. Now, don't let that be discouraging if you're single because trust me, Heavenly Father can test us in other ways and help us grow. But basically what I'm trying to say is we don't have to be afraid of these journeys and these big steps that Heavenly Father is asking us to take. Just like with these eight-year-olds who they're making big promises, Heavenly Father isn't going to judge them unrighteously. He's simply going to bless them more as they take a step of faith, as they take a leap of faith, and He will do the same in our lives. I'm so very grateful for my Heavenly Father. I'm grateful that from a young age, He chooses to help us enter into a covenant so that we He can bless us more. I'm grateful that, I'm grateful for the plan of salvation that makes us grow. This life can be really difficult and tricky, but it was supposed to be because there was no other way that we could return to our Heavenly Father ready to become like Him. I'm so very grateful for my Savior's atonement so that when I make mistakes, they actually can become building blocks so that I'm still just getting closer to my exaltation, right? Whether I make a right choice and I learn and I did a really good job and I got better or whether I made a mistake and I repented. Everything, when we are choosing to continually follow Christ and we're choosing to repent, can become building blocks towards our exaltation, towards becoming like our Heavenly Father. So very grateful for that, and I say that in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.